assume that we actually understand what Allah Azza wa Jal has to tell us. What Allah has to tell us is far more profound, far deeper and far more beautiful than any human attempt at trying to even explain it, much less translate it. That's not even possible. So on the one hand, you have this tragedy of so many Muslims underestimating the value and the power and the beauty of the Qur'an. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have people that are, that are trying to understand the Book of Allah and trying to study it in more depth. But when they present it to people, when they teach it to people, or at least try, they teach it in such a difficult way, in such a technical way that people just... Nothing, what is he talking about? He just quoted like 80 different scholars and talked about some grammatical stuff and some roots of this or that or the other, but I don't get it. I don't know what he's talking about. And then people come out of that kind of a lecture saying, man, that was deep. And then you say, what did he talk about? I don't know, but it was deep, man. That was deep. <laughs> you know? So I find myself in a very perplexed situation. On the one hand, these are profoundly beautiful, deep ayat. And even the whatever little I've been able to study is really for me sometimes too deep. I have to sit back, take a break. Wallahi, when I, sometimes I decide to study a passage of the Qur'an seriously, and I'll spend a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months on a few set of ayat. I'm reading a tafsir or taking some notes or listening to a scholar or just writing some things down. I get to a point where it gets so overwhelming for me that I just have to stop and go and like play with my kids and play a video game or something. Get it out of my head because it's overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. And so I, you know, this is one of those lectures where I'm overwhelmed about what to share with you and what to hold back. Obviously cognizant of the fact that there are children in our audience, there are young people in our audience, there are people in our audience that have no background in the Arabic language, or they don't even know what the word tafsir means, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. But even they need, they deserve to hear something about the Qur'an. They, need, they deserve to hear something about what makes it so beautiful. So I'm gonna try, I don't promise you anything. I do not give you any guarantees at all. I mean, I am expecting a colossal disappointment here. But still, you know, people say, I'm looking forward to your speech. I was like, you're looking forward to the wrong thing. But, you know, but let's, let's try to get at least some things that I've been able to grasp and some lessons that I, I think will, you'll find very beautiful too in this one of the most beautiful passages in the Qur'an. And at first, why did I choose this passage? I chose this passage inspired by many, many, many conversations with young Muslims from all over the world that are having a crisis of faith. They're just suffering a crisis of faith. Ustad Norman, I'm having some doubts. Ustad Norman, I'm not so sure. Ustad Norman, why does Allah talk about hellfire so much in the Qur'an? Ustad Norman, why, how come He says this? In the Qur'an, I'm disturbed by that. Yeah, you know, why is Allah gonna do this or that or the other? Why is this happening to me? And people are, they have these questions, these really deep questions. And these are questions being asked by 14 year olds. And it's shocking sometimes, like, dude, you haven't even taken a philosophy class yet. Thank you, YouTube. Right? So our kids are, young kids are exposed to these philosophical crises on top of the, all the other chaos in their lives, not to mention the disintegration of the basic family unit where parents don't know what it means to be parents anymore. We don't know what it means to have a regular conversation with our children anymore. We don't do this stuff. We don't, and we don't actually assume that our children are going to have major crises of faith in their young years. We assume their Islam is gonna be on autopilot, but when they get to that point and they start asking their parents some tough questions, a lot of us parents, we just kinda panic. We're like, oh, there's some kind of shaitan possessing this child. Go take him to the imam and the imam's gonna be like, and then it's gonna be gone. But this kid's problems have not gone away. He's got more questions and more questions and more questions. And yes, it is a fact that almost all of the conversations I've had with young people about their crisis of faith, it has boiled down to a combination of two things. On the one hand, at the core of it, there is a spiritual problem. At the heart of it, there is a spiritual disease, which is then wrapped with an intellectual confusion. But at the heart of it, there is still that spiritual problem. And I don't, I don't diminish or ridicule the intellectual problem, I don't. I think they both need to be addressed. But we need to understand and diagnose the problem first, before we offer medication. 
So when you, when our kids start having these kinds of crises, and we take them to, you know, to do some ruqya on them or something, we're attempting to solve possibly a spiritual problem, but have no given no respect or no credence to the fact that there may be an intellectual problem as well. There may be a psychological problem as well. And so I think this is one of those places in the Quran that is so important, that everybody should understand so, so well. This passage to me, you know what it did for me when I was a student in college? This was the passage that told me who I was. I was a student of psychology. And when I was studying psychology, there's one thing in psychology studies that there's no agreement on. You know what it is? Personality. The definition of personality. What is it? Oh my God, you've done a PhD in psychology, which is all of it is the study of the human personality. And the one thing we haven't figured out yet is what? What is personality? Subhanallah. Allah says this so articulately in the Quran. He says, Yes, Alunaka Ani Ruh, Kuli Ruhu min Amri Rabbi, Wama Uti Tum min al Ilmi, Illa Kalilan. They ask you about the Ruh. They tell them the Ruh is from the commandment of my master. You haven't been given except very, very little. Whatever we can figure out even about ourselves is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, you know what? Allah revealed to us something about ourselves that you could not have found in philosophy and you could not have found in psychology. This can only have come from Allah. And when I started seeing myself, pun intended, in light of these ayat, when I started seeing myself in light of these ayat, I figured stuff out about myself that I couldn't have figured out on my own. Really, I started looking at myself differently. And I hope I can do some of that for you today, even though my time is really, really short. Let's begin, inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah begins by saying, calling Himself the light of the skies and the earth. And many ulama have commented on the fact that this is actually a parable. Meaning, you can think of Allah like you think of light for the skies and the earth. Now what does that parable mean? First of all, the parable is so strong that there is no adatu tashbih, there is no device used to call it a parable. This is done in the Arabic language when two things are very comparable, when there's a very close association. So Allah wants us to deeply reflect and think about the concept of light, to think about light. So I'll say a few things about light. If there is no light, then doesn't matter how beautiful the universe is, we see nothing. Doesn't matter if you and I have both eyes. Our eyes are useless without the presence of what? Light. Reality as we know it around us is actually irrelevant entirely. All we have around us then is darkness and nothing. And incidentally, we know now that light isn't just a means by which we can see. Light is a fundamental to life on this earth. Without light, you don't get plants. And without plants, you don't have life. Life is, light is essential to life. And it's interesting that in the world, the places in the world, geographically speaking, that have the least amount of sunlight, the places in the world that are really gloomy and dark and cloudy, <coughs> Europe, um, have the highest levels of depression in the world. People don't enjoy their life. They, they're miserable and cynical and dark. It's weird that in, you know, in a city that is as well off as Seattle, Washington, a well off, a beautiful city covered in mountains, it's gorgeous, has one of the highest suicide rates in America. And many psychologists are trying to attribute it to the rains all the time and it's always dark and there's not enough sun. They get sun like maybe a couple of weeks in the year. So, subhanAllah, what a powerful parable. So now let's think about this light. There are two things. In the Arabic language, by the way, one of the words for eyes themselves is nur. Vision itself is also called nur. So in order for us to appreciate vision, to see reality around us, there are two things necessary. This light, the light inside of you, the light of your eyes, nurul ayn, and also you need light outside. A light inside and a light outside. If any one of those is missing, you're as good as blind. Isn't that clear? Is that simple enough for everybody? Okay. Now let's take it a step further. This is physical light. What I just talked about is physical light. But Allah is telling us something about spiritual light by making us think about physical light because they're similar. Now in the spiritual sense, there's a light inside of us. It's not here, it's here. There's a light Allah poured inside of us. When I was inside my mom's belly, then an angel was delivered to put some light inside of her. That would be something I would be pre-programmed with. All of you, the ruh is a form of light. 
that is inside of us. There's a light inside of us. But that light on its own can only see so much until, there, until there's what? Light on the outside, right? There has to be light on the outside. So now what is that light on the outside? Allah Azza wa describes His book. He describes His book and He says, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Believe in Allah and His Messenger and the light that we've sent down. Just like there are two ingredients to physical light, there are two ingredients to spiritual light. The human being has a yearning inside of him and her. They have, we have this light inside of us that wants something. It's looking for some kind of perfection because it came from a perfect source. So when revelation comes, when the word of Allah comes, when the teachings of His Prophet come وسلم, then they complete that light inside. This is the passage about these two lights meeting each other. So Allah says, and actually before I go further, I need some, some more things to talk to you about. Oh man, this passage. You know, right now we're inside this indoors hall. And there are these funky artificial lights. They're pretty cool. But we got these lights inside. And we need these lights. If this is not on, then it doesn't matter if it's day outside, we are completely blacked out. At night time, imagine what this, the electricity bill for one city is. Just imagine. Forget one building, an entire city, how much energy is spent to keep the lights on at night. Incredible, isn't it? Just think, absolutely mind-boggling how much energy is exhausted by human effort to put light when the sun's light goes away. Now Allah has a lamp, the sun. Allah created His light. And then we have our light. When Allah takes His lamp down, when the sun goes down, then you and I have to struggle to turn our lamps on. Back in the day, the lantern. You gotta turn the lights on, switch the bulbs, right? We got to do all of that. And as best as we can do, can we simulate His light? Is it as good as the light He gives us in the day? No. Mm -mm. Subhanallah. You can try to come up with whatever you can, but as much as you will, your light will be limited and overwhelmingly the world will be surrounded by darkness. And yet when Allah brings His light, when He brings the sun out, what happens? They say in Arabic, أَغْنَى الصَّبَاحَ عَنِ الْمِسْبَاحَ that the lamp made the, 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 the morning made the lamp irrelevant. You, your light and my light, does, keeping the lights on in the morning, especially if you're desi, you'd never do it actually. You don't even turn them on at nighttime. But anyway, you definitely wouldn't turn them on in the day. Because the sun's enough. Just open the window, move the curtains. The sunlight is enough. It'll light everything else up. In other words, Allah's light is overwhelming and undeniable. There's no escape from it. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And so we're beginning with something. I have my concept of light. I have my struggles towards light. My limited light. But Allah's light is it's just limitless. I can't even compare. And it comes from such a much higher source. It's a much more powerful source. Now he says, let me help you understand this parable a little better. Allah Azza wa Jal takes us deeper and deeper and deeper. He says, مَثَلُ نُورِهِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِصْبَاحٍ the example of his light, if you want to think about it, is like an indent. Now, we don't have those much anymore. Actually, in Texas, where I come from, we actually have those. But in modern homes, you have tube lights, and you have bulbs, and you have chandeliers. But back in the day, they didn't have running electricity. So what they used to have to do in homes, is they would put a little arch, like this, this curved arch, in the indent of a wall. So they could put a lamp in there. And they made this arch, so that when, the, when you put a lamp in there and you turn it on, the light hits the back of the arch and spreads to the rest of the room. So they designed it in a way that it would capture the light and then spread the light. That's the purpose of it. And it's shaped kind of like this. Like the door of a classical masjid or something. When you know, Sunday school kids draw a masjid, they draw a door like that. That's what an arch looks like. That's a mishkat, basically. Now Allah says, the example of Allah's light, if you want to think about it, in one way of it, it's like a lamp inside a niche. And so, fiha misbah. In it, there's a misbah. And interestingly, even the word misbah, which is called an ism ala in the Arabic language, it comes from the word subh. I know, هناك Arab, mashallah, fil majlis, ماذا يعني subh? What does subh mean? It means morning. They see, subh ha, mare paas bi hai, us. Yes, yes, I know. Thank you. Congratulations. You know word of Arabic. Okay. So, subh, misbah is actually a tool that simulates the morning. It tries to do what the morning is supposed to do. That's where you get the word misbah from. 
Okay? And it creates an awareness and alertness. That's why in old Arabic, another way of saying intabih is asbih. Another way of saying pay attention in old Arabic is actually to say asbih. Which actually doesn't just mean wake up, it means pay attention. In other words, obviously if you want to be alert to your surroundings, you need to have something that produces light. Anyway, moving along with this beautiful parable. There's an arch in the home, there's a lamp inside that arch. That little niche, there's a lamp inside. Fiha misbah. Al misbah fi zujaja. And then that lamp itself, you know, back in the day the lamps were not two, you know, bulbs. They were not bulbs. They were lamps that you have to light up like a candle, right? And the flame flickers. So what do you have to do to protect the flame? You have to put a glass around it. You put glass around it. And glass does a few things. One, it helps spread the light even more. So now there are two devices to spread the light. And two, of course, if it's windy or you have a fan on or something, the light's not going to go out. Incidentally, even bulbs today, aren't they surrounded by glass? Right? So Allah didn't let us change that much. Right? So al-misbahu fi zujaja. Now that, so Allah says it, the lamp is inside a glass. And I'm not explaining the parable yet, I'm just translating it so far. Az-zujajatu ka'annaha kawkab. The glass itself is like a brilliant star. Wait, I thought the lamp was going to be a brilliant star. He says, no, not the lamp, even the glass around it, when it twinkles, it looks like a star. And then he says, durri. The word durri in Arabic, subhanAllah, one of the most uh, interesting words I found in this, in this parable, شَيْءٌ يُنِيرُ بِنَفْسِهِ Something that's lit on its own. It's almost as though it's got its light of its own. Even though the, la- the, the glass itself is not something that's lit, but it's so pure and refined, it feels like it's got its own light. It's got its own shine. That's the glass around the lamp. Alright, moving along. كَوْكَبٌ دُرِّي يُقَدُ مِنْ شَجَرٍ Now this is, this is where things get really interesting. This lamp is now fueled. Because you can't just have a lamp back in the day, you have to have some oil inside there. Now the, instead of describing the oil first, Allah says actually it's fueled by a tree. Now tell me, this is very easy math, a science question for you. Where is the image of everything that's going on? Is that indoors or outdoors so far? Are we indoors or outdoors? We're indoors, thank you for being awake, very good. Now there's a, there's a niche, there's a lamp inside, and Allah says there's fuel inside that lamp. And that fuel comes from a tree. Tree is indoors or outdoors? It's outdoors. So Allah is making us leave the home and think about something outside. He's making us think, think about something outside. Fine. You know why that's important? I'll come back to it when I tie this all up together. Probably you'll remember nothing, but we'll see. I have high expectations from Canada. So, the idea is, this lamp is powered by something from the outside. Something from the outside is the source of its light. It's not itself. It is not itself. It's some tree outside. Now, min shajaratin mubarakatin, the first attribute of this tree is that it is, it's commonly translated as a, a blessed tree. But the word baraka in the Arabic language is a few things. I won't get into the linguistics of it, but it's increase. One of the meanings of it is increase. And the other is increase beyond expectation. The other meaning of barakah, in the, in the root origin of the word, is something that stays in its place. So, athabitu min, min shay, right? So, something that's in its place is also something that has barakah. Now, what Allah is saying is, its source is a stable tree. It's a tree that's constantly growing. It's a tree that whatever it gives, whether it's fruit or oil or extract, whatever this fruit, this tree gives, it gives beyond what you expected. You cannot codify it. You can't limit it to something like, I expect it to give this much. Every time you expect this much, it gives you more. So this lamp is lit by something that has no limits on its potential because its source is Mubarak. The source is Mubarak, okay? And I still haven't solved the riddle yet. I'm trying to build it for you so far. Now, he says, Mubarakatin zaytunatin. It is an olive tree. It's an olive tree. Now why in the world an olive tree? You know it's very interesting that in the Arabic language, the Arabic word for oil, oil itself is zayt. And the most refined kind of oil, the oil that the Arab is so obsessed with for millennia, that to this day, it cannot escape his dinner table. You cannot go to an Arab's house and not experience what? Olive oil. They, to them, when they think of oil, they, they think of zayt, they think of zaytun. And that's been there for thousands of years. That's why the word itself is the same. It's the same origin. 
Okay? They're tied together. So the most refined kind of oil, the oil that has the most diverse benefits, it can be consumed, it can be used to make food, it can be used to make sense, you can put it on your skin, you can make food, you know, fuel it, fuel your lamp with it, it has the most, most amount of benefits. And more, and then some. This is Zaytuna. But then Allah adds a strange, strange, strange description. He says, لا شرقيةٍ ولا غربيةٍ It's neither eastern nor western. Meaning the tree is not on the far end of one forest on the eastern end, not on the western end, it's on its own. This tree is unique. And when the sun comes up from the east, it's hitting one side of the tree. And as the sun is setting, it's hitting the other side of the tree. So this tree is constantly being baked by the sun. It gets the full advantage of the, everything the sun has to offer. And those are the kinds of trees that give the best kind of oil. Okay. I'm gonna to try to work back on my, my parable now. I just translated it thus far for you. To recap all of this so you don't lose your minds. Allah just said to appreciate His light, you can think of His light as a niche inside a wall. In a home. And by the way, when do you turn a lamp on? Night or, night or day? At night. No, no, not day, child. You must not be from a Desi family. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So you turn the lamp on at night. But when you turn the lamp on, the light needs to be protected, so you have a glass around it. The glass itself is super brilliant. It looks like a star, it reminds you of a star. Now when the word star is used, where does that make you think? Sky, right? Makes you think sky. Then the oil itself came from the most powerful, you know, pure source. That is neither lean to the east nor to the west. It gets the most exposure from the sun. Let's work our way back. The human rib cage looks like a niche in a wall. This? Looks like a mishkat. And Allah put inside it a little lamp. You know what that is? It's our heart. And inside that heart, Allah put a kind of fuel that is so pure, that could not have come from anywhere. Neither eastern nor west. And something that is directly, it was directly in contact with Allah Azza wa Jal, fully exposed to His light, like a tree that's fully exposed to the light of the sun. That's our ruh. We were directly in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. When He asked us, Alastu bi Rabbikum, qalu bala shahidna. We were directly in His presence. And so He took that pure fuel that made you who you are, that make you the lamp that you are, and He put that inside of you. He put that inside of you. That's who you are. You are actually in, at the core of you, at the core of me, there is light. And the purest kind of light. That's what that is. And now the glass around it is dirty or clean? It's clean, isn't it? What do you know about sins? When people do sins, what happens to their hearts? The glass starts getting dirty and dirtier and dirtier until it turns black. But you know what? Allah didn't give you a dirty heart to begin with. Unlike other theologies, we weren't born into sin. We were born into purity. Our hearts are clean. I mean, we let it get dirty sometimes. And you know what, if you, do, if you do nothing with a lamp, if you never clean it, does it get dusty or no? It does, so it can't be on autopilot, you have to clean it yourself. The original is beautiful, but if you don't clean it, you're not gonna know. You're just not gonna know. So this light is inside of us, and this, this fuel is inside of us, and it hasn't even been lit yet, by the way. It hasn't been lit up yet. Allah is just describing the glass and the, you know all of that, and, no light yet. And he says, يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ It is almost as though its oil wants to jump and catch the fire. وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْهُ نَارٍ Even though fire hasn't even touched it yet. This is the kind of fuel that's saying, man, I'm so pure, I'm so flammable, just give me a match. Let me light this up. I need to do, I need to fulfill my purpose. You ever see like petroleum? It kind of feels like it's catching towards the flame. Don't try this at a gas station. But I'm just saying, right? The idea of it wanting to catch light, that's been captured by the end. And then Allah says, Nurun ala nur, light upon light. Now what in the world does that mean? It means a ton of things, but I just want to share a couple of things with you. So far we have a lamp inside of us that is amazing. It's got, it's lit on its own, but not fully. It's, even its, its glass is like a light. But when the light of revelation, when the light of wahi comes inside through our ears, 
when we see, when the Sahabi sees the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the light goes through his eyes, and it goes into his heart, his heart already had the fuel, and one little spark, and boom, then you get light upon light. Nurun ala nur. The light of the fitrah, the light of the heart, meeting the light of wahi, the light of revelation. That is nurun ala nur. That's the passage of light. These two lights have to meet each other. Hey, I'm not done, stop that. Okay. Alright. You with me so far? So far so good? Now check this out. When do you turn the light on? I keep saying it so you remember it because it's a really difficult physics question. When do you turn the lights on? Nighttime. Which means that the light that Allah provided, the sun, He's taken it away. And in the absence of that light, you are in need of a lamp. But that lamp was fueled by something that had a direct relationship with the sun. It was trained well by the sun. So that in the absence of the sun, the light can carry on. The believer and his heart is necessary for dark times. When the light of revelation is taken away, that you are left behind. You and I are the sources of light for the world now. This light is not just for you. It's for the neighborhood around you. It's for your family. What's the point of a lamp if it doesn't light up its surroundings? What's the point of it if it doesn't light up its surroundings? And as a matter of fact, Allah compared that lamp and the glass of it even to a star. And the star makes you think of the sky at night, doesn't it? Al-Razi rahimahullah commenting on this ayah said, Ahlu sama yanzuruna ila al-ard al-mutala'li'a wa ahlu al-ard yanzuruna ila al-sama al-mutala'li'a he said, the people of the sky, meaning the angels, look at the earth lit up by light. And the people of the earth, look at the stars lit up by light. You know what he's talking about? Not physical light. When your flight lands at nighttime, you see lights all over the earth? That's not the light the angels see. They see the light of the hearts of believers. They look at the earth and they can see light at nighttime. We look up at the sky and we see the sky, the, the light of the angels, subhanAllah. You know, it's such a beautiful parable. Especially for dark times. You know, we're not evil people, we're not bad people. Allah gifted us with something so pure and so refined. Someone says, man, I'm not capable of being a good person. Actually, you are, you are so capable of being a good person. You are actually inherently good and incredibly good at that. Not just good, incredibly good. These pass this passage to me was like, whoa, so I'm like lit up on the inside? How do I keep this fuel going? Because the fuel is not from inside, is it? The fuel had to come from outside and it needs to feed. You need to clean it. And that's why Allah gave us this revelation. Allah gave us this book so we continue to recite it and memorize it and reflect on it. And every time we do, the light gets a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger. That's what it does. يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسُنَا نُورٌ عَلَى نُورٌ Then Allah says, it's so beautiful. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ So beautiful. Allah says, Allah guides all the way to His light, whoever He wants. Allah guides all the way to His light. In other words, right now, right now, Allah guided us to the light of this book, this revelation. The light of the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah gave us the appreciation of the light we have inside of ourselves. He gave us that light. But you know what? On top of that, the lam here suggests al-ghaya. You can say in Arabic, yahdi ila. Yahdi Allahu ila nurihi. But he didn't say that. He said, yahdi Allahu li nurihi. This lam is used when you reach the nth conclusion. You know what that means? We say when the day, the day on which you and I, by Allah's permission and mercy, when we make it all the way to the, the gates of paradise, what are we gonna say? Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana li hadha. Wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Alhamdulillah, the one who guided us all the way to this. That guidance is captured with a lam. All the way to something. Allah is saying, if you keep this up, I will guide you all the way to my light. I will have you meet me. You can see my light one day. You can get to be in the company of Allah one day. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ لَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ Allah. He says, and he gives examples for people. I was reading that part of the ayah and I said, Ya Allah, why'd you say that? Allah gives examples for people. It's like, 
Oh, then he explained it himself. Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. Allah knows everything. You know, a teacher, I'm in the profession of teaching. Uh, and the most difficult part of teaching is teaching children. And when you have to teach children, you have to give a lot of examples. You can't talk about, you know, just things as they are. You have to give example and example and example so they get it. Because children can't handle the, the straight up, you know, information. As a matter of fact, not even adults. I have to teach adults Arabic grammar. <laughs> it's not fun. So if I just say, you know, this is called a mubtada, and that's called a khabar, and this is called a muta'alliq, and this is this, and this. they're like, uh, I want to go home, you know. So I have to give examples. This guy came over here, we'll call him a mubtada. What are we going to call him a mubtada? Then his friend came over. His name is khabar. They like to play with each other. There's an is in between them, you know. <laughs> they're like, ah, get it, I wrote it down. I drew the truck, and you know. <laughs> You know, they'll do that. But you know what? A teacher has to do that because if the teacher only speaks based on knowledge, which is what I began this problem with, as a matter of fact, you can learn a lot about Allah's book. If you don't teach it, if you don't give examples, if you don't simplify, people might not get it. So Allah Himself left a legacy of giving examples. So you can get, Allah says, the concept of light and what it really means. What you have inside of you and what it really means. What the light of revelation really truly is, is beyond you. But at least you can appreciate some things by an example and don't think that this is the limits of Allah's knowledge. Allah is just giving, Allah knows everything, this was for you. يَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ He says, فِي بُيُوتٍ And I'm almost done, I have six minutes left, just wanted to make one last comment. And I want you to read this passage on your own, because this is not only a passage about light, it's also a passage about darkness. As a matter of fact, in the six minutes and 20 seconds that I have left, I want to give you two things. I'll, I'll put myself on a timer, inshallah. Two things. One is, Allah talks about homes, and He used the word buyut, not diyar. Diyar is also places. But buyut comes from baytuta, to spend the night. Again, we go back to the parable of the night. Right? And in that, He says, Allah, Allah, Allah allowed that those homes should be raised. The home is, your home is on the first floor. You might even live in the basement. But when you turn the lights on at night, and remember Allah at night, that Allah has raised your house without you even realizing it. And every house of Allah, every masjid is raised. And by the way, when are the lights of a masjid turned on? What are the three prayers when the light of a masjid are turned on? Come on, you guys got this. You got, I believe in you, I really do. Okay, Fajr, Maghrib, Aisha. So the times the lights are turned on are when things are getting dark outside. And all the prayers that are, that are prayed in the dark, we recite Qur'an louder so the light spreads further. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So now, what are we learning from all this? It's really cool light stuff. But what does that all mean? That means that maybe we haven't been paying attention to something inside of ourselves. Maybe between all of the video games and the movies, maybe between all the TV shows, maybe between all the social media stuff, maybe between all the gadgets and the picture taking and all the... It's just the spending, killing time. Maybe we've been killing a light inside of ourselves. Maybe some of you really like to buy lamps and chandeliers and put up, you know, nicer lighting inside your homes. And you love the stores and the restaurants that have beautiful lighting. But you know what? You and I start need to worrying about lighting inside of ourselves a little more. And part of that is developing a relationship with the houses of Allah that Allah has granted us. Even in the lands that we did, nobody expected there are going to be masajid. Nobody expected. How many people are actually going to visit the masajid? And if you're going to complain to me, well, the masjid, our masjid is a little difficult. We've got a situation at our masjid. Uh, the women have a closet. And once my aunt goes in, nobody else can, etc., etc. You know? If that's your situation, you know what? You need to participate in your masjid even more. We talk about not being able to change dictatorships in the Muslim world. We've got some situations right here. And we, no, nobody's gonna change those for us. We have to go ourselves as families. We cannot give up on the houses of Allah. 
They are our homes. They are the homes built so we can preserve our light and the light of our children. And sometimes you have masajid. May Allah protect them. The masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was an incredibly, incredibly busy place. And all kinds of stuff was going on there. And if the same stuff uh, that was happening in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was happening in a masjid today, then people will say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, hadha masjid. And then you're supposed to say, exactly. This is a masjid. This is a place for the entire family. And you know what? The people who get angry at you, their children need it. They don't even realize. Let them be angry. It's okay. Don't be afraid of the anger of a few. But we need to revive the relationship of an entire family with the houses of Allah. We need to do this. This is critical. This is not just a side matter. Then on top of that, we need to revive the legacy of praying as a family. If you're not going to go to the masjid, at least pray as a family in your homes. Turn the light on and pray. Wake up your children for fajr and pray. I know when your kids get a little older, you're like, ah, let them sleep, they got school. Just let them sleep, it's okay, it's okay. You know, the husband tries to go wake them up, the wife stops him. The wife tries to go wake them up, the husband stops You know what? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Give children a love of prayer. Not, don't make it something hateful to them. Make it something that they feel like their day was filled with light because they stood in front of Allah. Make it an event inside your home. Maghrib and Isha and Fajr, at least if you can't go to a masjid, turn your home into one. Turn your home, this is really important. This is how we preserve our light. This is how we do it as a family, you know. I, people are, we're, mashallah, you're here at this conference and you get a boost after this conference. But your real life as a believer, and my life as a believer, the real test of it is what happens inside the privacy of our homes. That's really where, it, that, that's what, what means something. You know, how many of us are praying together with our children? Some of you fathers, your children have never heard you reciting Quran. And that's a tragedy. And you say, I don't recite it properly. I don't care. You're not getting an ijazah in tajweed anytime soon. It's okay. Whatever you know, recite. Even that is light. It's not a floodlight. It's not a stadium light, but it's still light. It's still good. It's good enough. You know? Okay. Last, last comment about this thing. You know, Surah An-Nur is a surah that is filled with, some argue, 14 sections. And almost all of the sections have to do with Islamic law. It actually begins with the punishment of the zani, of the fornicator. It begins with that. And it goes on to many, many, many laws and regulations. Ahkam, ahkam, hukum, 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 hukum. And in the middle of all of this, there's a passage on light. In the middle of all of it is this passage. You know what that tells you? That tells you that without light, without iman, without that faith, that spirituality inside of you, those laws won't mean anything to you you will not be able to see the benefit in them. You'll be stumbling on them and doing them and you won't even know why. A lot of sisters asked me, in, back in the US, they asked me, why don't you do a lecture on the hijab? Because some sisters don't wear it. And I said, I will not do a lecture on the hijab because some sisters don't wear it. I'll do a lecture on the ayah of khimar as it occurs in Surah An-Nur and my motivation for the ayah, oh, my time just about to run out, when I was getting to the juicy part. My motivation for the ayah is actually belongs to Surah An-Nur because to Allah, all of those regulations, even the khimar, is a spiritual matter, not a social one, not a regulatory one. It has to do with the heart. That's what it has to do with. You know? This is, it's, it's an incredible realization when we look at the Qur'an in a holistic way. So my last comment, I know I'm 34, 35 seconds over, I'm gonna take exactly one minute over. Sue me. <laughs> you guys don't do that here, do you? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love RIS, I love it. Officially, okay. So, Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Just this part. Men who two things don't describe, distract them from remembering Allah. Their business and sales. Now, sales are a part of business. When you do business, Sales are a part of business, but Allah separated them and said, men who their business and their sales don't distract them from the remembrance of Allah. We learn a few things from that. Number one, you're supposed to do sales. You're supposed to do business. Just don't you let it, what? 
distract you from remembering Allah. We're supposed to be people of commerce. We're supposed to be people of careers. Allah is not saying that you fill up my houses and don't do anything else, number one. Number two, when you do spend your time properly in the dhikr of Allah, everything else you do, like business, is going to be fine because you won't be distracted anymore. It'll give you balance in your life. You can be people of great careers. You can be without forgetting Allah though. That's it, you know, without, without remembering Allah, it won't, that career won't mean anything. So if you address the spiritual needs of your, of your life, then the career and material needs of your life will be filled with barakah. You won't imagine where the promotions come from, where the next you know, business opportunity comes from, because you're remembering Allah properly. Just because of that, subhanAllah. So you have, to, you have to realize Allah will open the doors of risk for you if you don't let yourself get... Distracted, and so on this I conclude, if you are in business, then you know that in business you have to pay taxes, and you guys pay a lot of taxes, you know. And then you have to do inventory, you have to do purchasing, you have to do payroll, you have to do all this stuff, which is, a lot of it is just a headache. But there's one thing in business that makes it all worth it. There's only one thing in business, everything else is just, ugh. one thing. You know what it is? The sale. When the customer walks into the store and fills the cart with all the products, it's all worth it. When you have to write the check for your employee, it hurts you in the ribs. And it's very difficult. But when the, when the customer is writing you a check, or when he's counting the cash, oh, that's juicy. So Allah says, not only business distracts them, but even the juiciest part of business the one that makes it all worth it, which is what? The sale, even the sale doesn't get to them when it comes to remembering Allah. Because when you advance in your careers, it's gonna be Friday afternoon when your employer calls you in. Listen, I wanted to discuss your promotion with you, Muhammad. At 12.45, could you make it? Actually, I gotta go remember Allah. Mm. Some of you are gonna earn grocery, own grocery stores. Cust the best customer is gonna walk in right at Jum'ah time. Right at Jum'ah time. And he's just stuffing his card in and you're at the cash register like, oh, Salat or this or... And you're like, sir, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to close shop because I gotta go pray. And he says, what kind of customer service is this? I'm never coming back here again. And you know, it's okay. Wallahu khayrul raziqeen. Allah is the best provider. These people will not get distracted. You will not compromise. You will not let your career... You will not let your career get in the way of remembering Allah. And when you can do that, we'll be a different kind of people. We will just be a different kind of people. May Allah pe make all of us a people of light. May Allah Azza wa Jal fill this gathering with light and put light in our hearts and strengthen it with His word and with the love of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah Azza wa Jal continue to strengthen our light until we meet the ultimate light. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. components of a sentence in Arabic. And the standard sequence is Mubtada and then Khabr and then Muta'alliq Khabr. What would that imply is وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ That's the standard order of a sentence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shuffles this sentence and He puts عَنِ اللَّغْوِ first. So the way it should be translated because of this shuffle, I'm mentioning all of this because there's an impact on how we understand the meaning of the ayah. Typically it's translated those who refrain from vainful you know, activities in vain or speech that is vain, that is useless. But it actually implies those who especially in regards to al lagu which means useless activity or speech. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Especially in regards to it, they ignore it. They stay away from it. They they you know, take special precaution to rid themselves of situations that involve Allahu. So what is Allahu? Allahu in the Arabic language, it refers to something that doesn't have any benefit. In the religious sense, it refers to something that has no benefit in your deen and has no benefit in your dunya. Like, you know, you go to work. Perhaps it's not a religious experience, but it's not Allahu because it has some benefit. You're there for a purpose. You go to school, there's a purpose, right? You're playing sports, at least there's some health benefit. There's something there. 
But when you engage in activities that have no benefit in your worldly life and have no benefit in the hereafter, it first and foremost in forms of speech and secondly in forms of any other activity, this would be under Allahu. So the true believer is defined as someone who first of all focuses and is humble and overpowered in their salah. And second, that they have this characteristic of being almost allergic, you could say, to any situation of Allahu. Now, practically what that means is for you and me, a lot of times, we don't, we can't even re, we don't even realize that we're engaging in such activity. Small talk, unnecessary, you know, just cracking jokes here and there. Now, making a joke here and there is okay. But if you're spending a half hour talking about just nothing, just hanging out, chilling, right? Now, you could argue, well, I'm not doing anything haram, I'm just hanging out with my friends. And we're just going out for some sandwiches. But, we're, you know, that whole entire trip and that whole entire hangout session has no benefit in deen or dunya except the food, then this was lahu. So you even use that opportunity to be among friends, to spend time with each other, to actually refrain from, you know, wasteful speech. Speech that has no benefit whatsoever. You know, a lot of times, people are involved in different industries. Like for example, there are people that are all programmers, and they, all, they kind of naturally tend to have programmer friends. And accountants have accountant friends because they're on this, in the same industry. Doctors have medical student friends, right? And it happens. Business people have business friends. And it just, you know, we form these professional acquaintances. And what happens is when you're sitting together in lunch break, what are you talking about if you're a techie? You're talking about the new software release that just came out or the new version of what language just came out or, you know, how the standards are changing and the protocols are changing or the job market is hot over there and soft over here and stuff like that. Right? That's your entire half hour is spent talking about that. If you're among friends, you're into video games or something, and I'm guilty of this too, among youth, you know, you're, you're talking about what, you know, what new game came out and man, it wasn't any good and the ending was boring and blah, blah, blah. You know, you just spend, you could spend endless amounts of hours just talking about this stuff. And now, subhanAllah, shaitan has worked hard and produced new activities, new opportunities for us to engage in lahu by means of online role-playing games and, you know, all of these, you know, they, literally, you could sit behind a screen for hours in your virtual life where you're known as, you know, something Muslim X5 or something, and you're riding a spaceship, <laughs> you know, building your empire on some planet, and you're just, you're in it for like hours and hours, and you have no idea what's going on in the real world, right? And th this is happening, this is very, very real. The youth are involved in this kind of stuff all the time. And now there's, you know, other opportunities for, for Lahu, like Facebook or MySpace. My goodness, I got onto Facebook about a month ago in order to get in touch with some friends and to promote some Arabic classes and things like that online. I get on not two minutes after signing on, people I have no idea, men and women, I get emails, Fulan and Fulan wants to be your friend on Facebook. I don't want to be your friend on Facebook, I don't want to be your friend in life. <laughs> Leave me alone. But you know, teenagers are on these things with different screen names, not their real names, and they're on there and they have these double lives where they're getting to meet boys and girls and all kinds of crazy stuff is going on in the Muslim living room, in their bedroom. Because the computer is sitting there. So we've given them opportunities for Allah. We've given them such opportunities. So one has to really, if you want to practically tackle this issue, you know, we don't talk about the ayat of Qur'an in a vacuum when they say the believer stays away from Allah. We have to address what are the forms of Allah, the attacks of shaitan by which he indulges the believer in wasting their time in our times. What are his attacks? If we don't understand his attacks, we can't defend against them. So what are the attacks in our times? It's the, the profuse use of the internet. It's the addiction to YouTube. What's the top video today? Right? What came out? And then, you know, there's, there's this addiction to television of, of TV series. Oh my God, what's going to happen in the next episode? You know, and you can't wait and you're discussing it with your co-workers because it's the season finale or the season premiere or something. And it's ridiculous. I mean, this culture has been, it's been so exaggerated. You know, a few years, maybe 10 years ago it was about sports, playoffs and things like that. They used to be a big deal in media culture. Nowadays, you know, when I was way back, I mean, four or five years ago when I was in corporate, you know, people used to watch, I think it was Survivor. And my co-workers, all non-Muslims, that all, that's all they could talk about. Man, did you see Survivor last night? And one's like, man, no, I got stuck in traffic. I can't believe it. You know, did you record it for me? And this is their whole life. Is, you know, these shows and these entertainment forums, and they're just addicted to them. Their entire lives are spent around them. 
And then it's, it's incredible because there's such zombies. Muslims fall into this trap too. We become such zombies, then we end up buying their t-shirts and you know, their paraphernalia and the action figures and you know, our kids want their video games. Uh, you know, Spider-Man came out, you want to get a Spider-Man video game and then Spider-Man action figure and a Spider-Man t-shirt and you know, it just keeps going and going and going, right? But it, there's this, this in, in, entire web of, of a trap that we've put our youth into. Where does it all begin though? What's the root of it? The root of it is a careless exposure to media. That's what the root of it is in our times. In our times, most of the evil that our kids and ourselves are exposed to is not because we go out to a club, because we don't have to. We can just watch a club sitting at home. Right? We, it's not that we go out you know, to these fahshat places or we go hang out in these promiscuous places. We don't need to, because all of that is virtually available. Right? So it's really the careless, the careless use of media inside the home. And especially for parents, we have to be extra, extra careful what our kids watch, how much they watch, what they're exposed to. We don't even know. I mean, wallahi, the stuff, I mean, uh, these are the two things that are connected together, so I'm mentioning them together. Allahu, the next two ayat also, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ and وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ These are all connected things. One leads to the other. Allahu is a waste of time. The believer knows time's running out. The most precious asset you and I have is our time. And so if we start wasting our time, that's a proof that something's wrong with our iman. We don't realize the value of this time. You know, if you were taking an exam the next day, there's a final exam for your last class before graduation, and if you miss this exam or you mess up on this exam, you're going to be set, you know, you're going to be delayed for another year or something. And that the night before or hour and hour before you're sitting there watching, you know, movies or playing a video game, you'd have to be crazy. You must not care about your exam, right? Because there's a sense of urgency. You're not going to see a serious student do that. You're going to see them working hard. If you got a new job and your boss gave you a deadline for a project and you're two, three hours away before submitting it, you're going to spend the entire night in the office because it's work. You got to do it. It's important. There's a deadline. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us certain things we have to do within a deadline. But the crazy thing is, Allah didn't tell you and me what my deadline is and what your deadline is. That deadline is death. But Allah kept it a secret subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're constantly in a state of emergency. To acquire more and more good and to get away from more and more evil. Right? And this sense of urgency can be lost. And you can retain it by retaining a relationship with Quran. So this is, you know, if you don't have that sense of urgency, then you got time. You got time to kill, you can hang out and do whatever. And I'm not saying you have to shut down your life and be in depression all the time, worried about hellfire, because the believer had balance, right? There's hope and there's fear. But at the same time, we've become way too lax. We're the extreme on the lax side. We're wasting way too much time in our lives, not paying attention to where it's going. So, وَهُمْ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ بِمُعْرِضُونَ Then he says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ And also the construction of this ayah, the way it's formulated, is beautiful. It covers two things at the same time. As zakah you all know. Even if you don't know the rest of the ayah, you heard the word zakah, right? So you obviously got the sense, these are the people that take care of their zakah. But you know, there's a fi'il that goes with zakah usually in the Qur'an, which is mu'toon or yu'tuna. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ Or as zakati yu'tuna. You don't even need the lamb there anymore. Okay, because it because serves as maf'ul bihi. Here Allah uses the harf jad lam, liz zakati. And instead of saying mu'tun, He says fa'ilun. Which tells us two things. They're actively engaged in the purification of their wealth, which is one implication, because still zakah is a universal term. But also zakah in its generic sense. What does zakat mean? It means purification. So they are actively involved towards purification. They have a goal to purify themselves, and they're actively involved in it. And there's another nuance in this ayah that's very beautiful. You know the word, uh, the, the ism, or a noun simply speaking in English, a noun is stronger than a verb. You know a verb is like, he did, right? And a noun is like the doer, right? Or he worked is a verb, and the worker is a noun. Which one is more permanent? A worker is always a worker, right? But if he worked, that's in the past tense, that's not necessarily a guarantee for the present tense, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla sometimes he uses the nominal form, the noun form, the ism form, sometimes he uses the fi'il form. And when he uses the ism form, it denotes permanence. So what he's saying by using the word fa'ilun instead of yaf'alun, is that they're constantly engaged in attempts to purify themselves. And then also there's another nuance here, because there are two words for, for working, for doing things. To do action, there is, you know, amal, amilun, 
and there's fa'ilun, fi'il. There's amal and there's fi'il. Both of them are translated as action. Okay? Yaf'alu, he does. Ya'malu, he does. Or he works. Either way. So what's the difference between them? See, amal is something you think about it and then you do it. And a fi'il is something that comes to you so naturally, it's like second nature. Like breathing is a fi'il. It's not a amal. It is a fi'il. Because you don't have to think about it. You just do it. When you take one step after another when you're walking, this is a fi'il. The mashiyah is a fi'il. Why? Because you don't have to process any, should I put the left foot first, the right foot? You know, you don't have to think about that. So the act of seeing, the act of hearing, that, that come to us naturally, effortlessly, these are fi'il. So what is Allah saying about the true believer? Their efforts to purify themselves come to them naturally. It's not something they're uncomfortable with, it's part of their daily routine, almost like breathing. And what it also implies is, the one day they miss out on their routine, they feel uncomfortable, like something's missing. You know, the acts that they do, they, they, these acts of purification come to them so naturally, when they're not engaged in them, they're uncomfortable. So what are these acts, these proactive behaviors that make us purified? The easiest ones that you could start off with is good company. And of course, you're not going to find good company anywhere in our times except at the masjid. The fortunate few that are, that are concerned with good company will all be together at the masjid. And I dare to say it's not going to be the MSA, I'm sorry. Okay? It's going to be the MSA in some limited respect, but if you know what's happening at the MSA nowadays, then you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what the MSA is, say Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay? So, you know, it's, there's good there, but there's still a lot of fitna there. Right? It's, a lot of kids go to the MSA as a, as a resource. They're going to learn something about their deen. But it's kind of the deaf leading the blind sometimes. It's, it's, it's problematic. The safe haven for the Muslim is... The masjid. That's the divine institution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted this ummah. So that's the first thing. You want to remain pure, you stay in the company of those will, that will better you. Kunu ma'as sadiqeen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Then the other thing you can do is, you have to become a, peop, a person of dhikr. Meaning, you have a daily regiment of you're going to recite certain amount of Qur'an. You're going, you're going to make certain adhkar from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're going to make the dua before you enter the house and you leave the house and you go in the bathroom and you come out of the bathroom and you put your clothes on and you, you know, all of these different duas that the messenger made sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these are not extras. They're really important in keeping us pure. Because they keep Allah's thought, Allah's remembrance conscious in our minds, right? So the first was good company and the second is to memorize the important adhkar. And also included in that is at least a daily you know, uh, segment of recitation of Qur'an. That has to be part of our routine. Now this is the starting point. Then you can only graduate and advance from here. But don't think too high yet. At least establish these goals and then we'll worry about more. Right? A lot of times what happens is we set our goals on the 20th floor and we, we, you know, we haven't even entered the building yet. Right? So it's, it's kind of problematic. So set yourself some simple goals. You know, don't recite, recite three juz of Qur'an a day. You know, I'm not asking you for that. Start small, even a page, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, something. Start somewhere. You know, don't set your goal so high, you know what, I'm going to do this thing. And you recite one day, you're sitting there 40 minutes reciting Qur'an and you're not used to it. Guess what, the next day you're not going to do it. Because you're not used to it. You're burnt out the first day. We don't want that. You know, the best of the deeds are the ones that are continuous. That have continuity in them. So take it easy on yourself and build it slowly, inshaAllah ta'ala. Part of this also that I would highly recommend, just to build a love and affection for Qur'an, is on a daily basis, Muslims have to try and memorize at least an ayah of Qur'an. And if you take it very lightly, like after Fajr, 10-15 minutes, that you can you know, take on and just memorize just one ayah. Or you're, if you're commuting on the train, that's even easier. Driving is kind of hard. They do have some CDs that repeat the ayat. Or I'm sure you can make the MP3s, you're pretty tech savvy. Right? Where the ayat are repeated and you can kind of listen to them over and over again. But if you're, if you're commuting on the train especially, then just keep the Qur'an with you, or at least keep a juz with you, and you're just reading an ayah 10-15 times. The same ayah over and over again. Before you get to work, you know the ayah by heart. And you come back and you do that, now you know two ayat by heart a day. And within a month, you know a whole juz of Qur'an. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it sounds remarkable, but that's what happens. If you make a routine out of it. You're not doing anything else with that time except snoozing. So might as well use it for that. By the way, don't try to do that while you're driving. <laughs> I've seen some people do that and it's, I don't recommend it. So, it doesn't make you more religious. Okay. <laughs> so let's just clarify that. Anyway. So, وَهُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ and they are the ones that in regards to their privates, they guard them. And you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have put this ayah in more subtle terms. لِحَيَائِهِمْ Right? 
the, the Allah could have said in regards to their shame, they guard their shame. He didn't say that. He went straight at the subject, at the heart of the subject, and said, he said, they guard their private parts. It's a very graphic ayah. And why is it like that? Because the subject has to be taken head on. You have to understand the, the seriousness of this subject, including myself. And how easy this attack of shaitan can infiltrate and destroy the iman of a believer. You see, the shaitan is not concerned that the guy that's dancing away at the club or drinking away at the bar or taking some shots of drugs, that he's going to end up doing something shameless. He's not worried about them because they're already on track. He is worried about the loose ends, the sales that he hasn't made yet. Those are the believers. That's who he's concerned with. So the more a believer tries to purify himself, the more he or she will find that the opportunities to engage in shamelessness are throwing themselves at him. Throwing themselves at him. Women out of nowhere will come up to you and say, Hi, how are you? Out of nowhere. And you know you have a beard and you're trying to look unattractive. You know, trying to save yourself in society. But you know, shaitan will come to these women and say, Hey, by the way, I've got one of my key prospects here, why don't you go say hello or smile at them? You know, when you, when you serve them at the counter, just give them an extra smile. Right? Or make small talk or something. They will try to mess with you. The shayateen will try to mess with you by means of other things. Right? And you know, this is something you have to be extra, extra careful of. Because the easiest thing for you to lose is your sensitivity to shamelessness. In a society where shamelessness is as common as the air we breathe. It's just part of the culture. Women barely dressed at the grocery store, just get used to it, you know. The first day you come from Saudi or Pakistan or some religious village in Egypt, and you come here, the first few months you're like, Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. And you get to know the pavement really well, because you don't look anywhere else, right? You know every crack that comes your way. But after a while, you kind of, you know, it's life, what are you going to do, you know? I came, you know, I, my early schooling was in Saudi. All boys school, all male teachers, and you know. And my, I come here and my parents, may Allah reward them, they put me in high school, right? Public high school in Queens. So I go into Queens, and I walk into the classroom, and there's men, and these girls are barely dressed, and I'm completely embarrassed. I mean, I'm, my face is red, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm in the wrong place or something, right? And those first few months were insane for me. I wouldn't even touch the railings to go up the stairs because Najas people have touched them. You know, these people are you know, in the one mushrikeen and Najas. So, you know, but you know what happens over time? Oh, what's the big deal? Let's just, you know, that's just life. What are you going to do? How long are you going to fight it? So you have this culture shock and eventually you get over it and it becomes part of the norm. That's exactly what we don't want. That's not what we want. Because as soon as, the, as soon as the believer becomes, you know, desensitized to evil, to fahsha, then his iman is in trouble. And her iman is in trouble. You know, our, nowadays an example of that, uh, you know, kids will say, we're going to go see this movie. It's only PG-13. Or it only has one bad scene. And we're renting a movie, it's got a bad scene, yeah, but we're going to forward the part. <laughs> right? No, really. And, and, and you, the parents say, oh yeah, just PG-13, yeah. Some sexual content, that's not a lot of sexual content, it's just some sexual content. I'm, I'm saying this explicitly because this is the reality. Our kids are going to watch these things. And the parents are endorsing them. They're okay with it. Now the new thing that's come out is, you know, Wallahi, I heard this at, at our own Sunday school, and this is not the exception, this is the norm. You know, kids around the country, they don't talk to the Muslim you know, leaders, their teachers, their peers, they talk to each other. So you have to spy on them a little bit. So I had this habit of spying on kids, you know. And so I'd be around the back and the kids are talking, my mom let me buy a game that's NC-17. Man, it's awesome, you guys, he's cursing and everything. And they're real, they're real proud of it too, right? And they got it for Eid, subhanAllah. <laughs> they're celebrating the, you know, the obedience to Allah with <laughs> fahsha and disobedience. So we have to, you know, this is serious, serious stuff. Once you are desensitized to what you see on the screen, then you have, the, the only logical next step is, you will not lower your eyes when you're walking down the street. And the logical next step is, you're going to try to do what the people on the screen do. Right? And it's just one step after another. And it's just a downward spiral. So how do you counter this culture? How do you fight this thing? You fight this thing first of all by taking probably the most difficult step you will in your, in your adult life is to cut TV off. It's a very difficult step. 
It's the, I, I, can, I can tell you if you're used to it, it's not easy. Right? But we as Muslim families, for the sake of our children and our own dignity as Muslims, we have to do it. We have to cut TV out. If you want the news, go to, go to the dot coms. Right? And avoid the banner ads even there. But you know, there's ways of getting the news. There is still the radio, alhamdulillah, it's still in place and it still tells you the news. Right? You can get in the, the excuses that I used to get a few years ago before you know the, the media on the web spread like the, like the way it did. It used to be, well, how are we going to get the news? If you know, the, you know, we we need to listen to CNN and Fox. I'm like, you don't need to listen to CNN and Fox. But even if that's your excuse, that excuse is dead now because better media outlets for the news and information are available online. Probably you get more reliable information online than you do on television, right? So, you know, get rid of those excuses and clean up your house. Don't get your children a portable video iPod. Don't get them a video iPod. Because you don't know what they can put on there. They can put stuff on there and hide it in folders you don't even know exist. They're very smart. They can name it directory like, you know, uh, root or system or, you know, they'll name it something creative. Ah, this is just, you know, information files. And it's in there. You have to understand, our kids are very, very smart. They're sharp. And they're on top of technology, the latest means. So you have to, you know, watch out for this. There's new statistics out about these video players that, you know, that children are bringing to schools and get, they're getting confiscated and they're being looked at and most of them have pornography in them with children, elementary school. So this is serious business. This is not a joke, and this is not the children of the kuffar alone. Don't think like that. Don't think that your oh, I come from a Muslim family, our kids don't do those things. Please, let everybody wake up. Okay? If the children of Yaqub alayhi salam can get to the point of being willing to kill their brother, who are children of a prophet, and grandchildren of a prophet, and great-grandchildren of a prophet, they are sons of Yaqub, grandsons of who? Ishaq alayhi salam, great grandsons of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. If they can't argue, Yaqub alayhi salam is not saying they come from a good family, they wouldn't do anything bad. Because he doesn't have that argument. Righteousness is not inherited in bloodlines. And if, they're, if they can do something bad, none of our families are pure enough. Because they're three generations of prophets. Right? You can't say, oh, we're from this family or that family, or our last name is this, and we brought the pure bloodlines here, so our children are, are free of these temptations. They have these temptations. And we have to make sure that they fight them. And this is also, if it's not a concern for yourself, it will not trickle down to your children. You have to have that concern yourself. A lot of times I've seen the hypocrisy, the nifaq inside the household. Parents are watching something, the kids come and say, hey, leave the room. This is not for you. This is not for little kids, it's for us to watch this stuff. You know? And the kids, they, they talk, you befriend them, they talk, yeah, my mom watches, and my dad watches these movies, you know, there's a lot of singing and dancing in it. But I just hear about it because they don't let me watch it. You know? But I know all the songs by heart, because you know, I've heard them so many times. And this is the hypocrisy inside the house of the Muslim. It's insane. So we have to understand, this is serious stuff. And it will have very, very negative consequences later on. It's, it's bad enough for our deen, but it will ruin your dunya. And let me tell you some horror stories. I'm not going to name anybody specific, or tell you any specific story. But it's happened to me more than a dozen times. That parents have come up to me when I've given a talk like this and said, Can you talk to my teenage son? Can you talk to my daughter? She's got some problems. She's not listening to me anymore. And I think they've got, she's got some boy problems or some girl problems, right? And you know why that happened? Because now that they're teenagers and they're independent, it's too late, the ship has already sailed. When they were under your midst, you didn't care. You were putting the extra hours in at work, so you can put the down payment in for the house. And the wife was also doing some work somewhere else, so the, baby, the cable TV was babysitting the child. And now that they have the power to act out what they've been watching all along, their shaykh on TV has been doing that all along, and now they're acting it out, now you're surprised. Don't be surprised. They're just doing taqlid of what they've, you know, the dars they've been getting every day. That's what it is. It's not, it's not a surprise. How could they do this to me? How could you do this to them? <laughs> they didn't do this to you, you did this to them. You programmed, programmed them this way. Just because we have Muslim names, if we are part of the same exact culture that everybody else is a part of, the outcome is going to be the same. Right? We have to change the environment within the homes and how our children are taking in media. So this is you know, a very important thing, inshallah ta'ala, for all of us. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ 
Again, I want to leave this with a, a few pieces of practical advice. Please do not put a computer in your child's room. If you want to put a computer, put it in the kitchen, put it in the living room. Don't face it against the wall, face it against the outside so anybody who walks in can see what's going on in the screen, right? Do not make sure, make sure you check the histories and make, have software that can recover the internet histories on your browsers so you can find out if your child has a Facebook account or a MySpace account and what their, you know, uh, username is because they will have other usernames and you don't even know your children are living double lives and they are believe me there's a lot going on out there you know and you will find it and you'll be shocked how can this be but you have to you have to get involved in your children's life and the final piece of advice don't freak out because we come from a culture when our children disappoint us in the least bit then we say, how could you do this to me, your disappointment? You know, we come from a culture where the child gets an 88 on the exam, and he's so proud of himself, and he comes to the father and says, Dad, I got an 88. Okay, next time get a 90. And you get a 90, why didn't you get a 100? What's the matter with you? Right? There's always you could have done more. There's no appreciation of our children. Right? And so when something like this, you find out your boy was, you know, your, your, your son comes to you one day and says, you know, Dad, this girl asked me to go to the prom. And he just comes to you not knowing what your reaction is going to be. Poor kid, well, he, he asked the wrong question. Then you, uh, he will ask, well, what is prom, bete? And then you, <laughs> then you tell him, then the child tells him the, what the prom is, and my goodness, you know, it's like his, you know, the extra hair fell off the head, and he's screaming, we brought you to America for this, and you give him a beating, and you yell at him, and you tell the mother, and then you, you know, all kinds of craziness inside the house. This child will swear to himself that if next time there is a girl talking to him or anything like that, the last person he will ever tell is who? You. The mother, the sister, the brother, he will not tell you. Who will he tell? His non-Muslim friends that will say, yeah, that's awesome, man, go for it. That's who he's going to tell. So you have to learn to take it and be able to deal with it. You cannot deal with it if you freak out. Because that would have worked in Pakistan, maybe. It would have worked in Bangladesh, it would have worked somewhere else, it's not going to work here. It is not going to work here. Your children will simply shut you out. There will be someone outside and someone else when they walk inside those doors. There will just be someone else. I can tell you this from personal experience. Wallahi, I've seen this many, many times. Children are totally different. Totally different people. Like you wouldn't recognize them when they are at school, when they are on campus, as opposed to when they are at home. Completely unrecognizable. And the parents would have no idea. They're completely oblivious because all they care about is the report card. The report card's good, everything else is good. Let me get you this, let me get you, let me get you a cell phone of your own. And I'm not going to check your phone history. Nor will I receive your bill and go through all the phone numbers. Who's been calling you? I don't need to do that because, you know, it's a good boy. Get grades. You know, boys with good grades and girls with good grades in this society, Muslim society, have drinking problems, have drug problems, have boyfriend, girlfriend problems, and that's the reality. So let's wake up to it, right? We have to face these things. When ladina hum li furujihim hafidun has to become a movement within the Muslim community. We have to gather our youth together and talk about these things and help them cope with these things. Because what we're asking them to do, these things, this is crazy. Did you know? And I, don't be shocked by this. You go to high school and many of the high schools, and if you if you haven't you know committed zina, then you're an object of ridicule. And this guy hasn't even done anything yet. You know, he's still just a kid. They're being made fun of because they haven't committed zina. Imagine that. And that's the culture in which they are. So what we are asking them to do is making them the object of ridicule among their peers. This is a very difficult thing for them to be asked to do. And if we don't have any, any measures of supporting them, of having them talk to someone, of letting these feelings out, these frustrations out, giving them alternative venues, then we have monumentally failed. You know, the, the, the signs of our failure are when we are having talks and our children are not here. Our youth are not here. Because they have no interest in being here. And that's our fault, not their fault. We have to make the masajid interesting for our youth. Otherwise, it starts with lagu and it ends with fahsha. It starts with lagu. It starts with wasting their time and eventually when you waste your time, you find the worst things to do with your time and that is what this society is calling you towards. So this is very, very serious business. For our personal selves, illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanuhum fa innahum ghayru malumin. But they, they only guard, they don't guard their privates in regards to their spouses or what their right hands possess. 
And, and in those cases, they are not to be blamed, inshallah ta'ala. We'll discuss the spousal relationship tomorrow, inshallah. And it's going to be PG-13, so uh, don't bring your younger kids tomorrow. Because we have to discuss, this is an important subject, of preserving your own, uh, you know, haya, your own shame, inside the house, even after you're married. Before you're married, you're thinking, oh man, once I get married, I won't ever be tempted again. And after you get married, you say, what happened here? <laughs> so we have to discuss this subject. Because it is a problem for a lot of husbands and a lot of wives. You know, the fahsha is still attacking them. And the shaitan, all he wants to do is ruin marriages, right? So we have to address this subject and take it head on, inshaAllah ta'ala. So we'll discuss this ayah when it comes tomorrow. Also, we'll, what we'll discuss tomorrow, bi'idhnillah, is the issue of what your right hands possess, which is supposed to be some controversy, right? These concubines, these, these Muslims, they allow for women to be owned and all this kind of stuff. We'll discuss that subject tomorrow. Barakallahu yu alakum fil Qur'an hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikil hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.